should be getting started here. Um, you know, the, the conversation about Civi CRM version 5 started a while ago. We had a little bit of a conversation at the, the San Francisco conference back in April. And for, the, for that conference, I decided to use this picture of a salad. And when I chose this picture, the first thing I thought was my co-presenter, Karun, who this time is taking the back seat and is sitting in the audience. Um, I thought he was gonna say, dude, where's the meat? And sure enough, as soon as he saw this, he said, dude, where's the meat? And it's a little bit of a you know, conflict because I'm vegetarian, so I never eat meat, and I don't think he ever eats a meal which is missing meat. In fact, I think it's sort of a principle with him, but <laughs> notwithstanding. All right, so why Civi CRM version five? Well, yes, that's, that's one reason. I mean, we could skip around versions sort of like Java did with 1.x and Java five. Um, we could go sort of like the Windows strategy and do Windows ME and Windows Vista, you know, happy qualitative names, but that's a terrible, terrible story. So we're never going to do that. Um, but there must be a serious reason. Okay, that doesn't make any sense either, so not the right slide. Oh, yes, there is a reason, a salad, it's a metaphor. A salad is something that is simple to make, right? It, it's clean, it's crisp, and the key to making a good salad is to have good ingredients, right? If you pick lettuce that's from eight years ago, you're gonna have a terrible salad. So if you pick tomatoes from five years ago, it doesn't work very well. But if you go to the market and you sort through the ingredients that are available and you pick the best ones, then it's just a matter of tossing it together. So, all right, what does that mean for Civi, right? Well, Civi has become a bit complex to work with from a developer perspective. Uh, consider any interesting customization, such as generating annual tax receipts in uh, a number of countries, the federal t uh, tax authority requires that the nonprofit generate a document and provide it to the constituent so that the constituent can report their donations and claim a tax deduction. Big process, right? Or integrating event management with Facebook. You need to track some IDs on the Civi side and on the Facebook side and have authentication tokens and pass things back and forth. Anything interesting. You've got to create some data, create some forms, create some back-end processes, and doing that is a difficult process in Civi, more difficult than in other frameworks. So you create, oh excuse me, you start by installing Civi and the CMS in the developer configuration, which can be a bit different from a production configuration. You create an XML schema file, and hopefully you're working on core because it's a lot easier to create an XML schema file on core. If you're working in an extension, it requires some extra work, it's, it's a bit difficult. Then you run gen code, you manually create this BAO class, then you manually create this API file, then add some routes in your XML, create a page controller, and so on and so forth. It's a bit of a process. For the discussion here, uh, I wanted to start out by focusing on steps two through six, uh, creating new entities, creating new data models in Civi, which is particularly difficult. And we're looking at doctrine as a, a way to improve that process. What is doctrine? It's an object relational mapper. It provides PHP interfaces that are supposed to be easier to code with. Uh, but they map into SQL uh, systems in a very predictable uh, fashion. Why start with doctrine? There's a lot of things that people want to improve in Civi. Doctrine is one of them. Um, excuse me, the data layer is one of them, but there's also the question of how to organize the business logic versus the form logic. There's the uh, use of quick form as the form technology, which is fairly old and pretty much everyone who's worked with it has complained about it. So why start with doctrine? The best analogy I can come up with is in my backpack here. It's a bit like this. 
right? You have a, a mess of wires and you want to untangle them. You have to pick one wire and sort of start to de-thread it, right? To get the entire thing in order, you're not, you're going to wind up touching each of the wires, but you have to start with one of them and by the end of the project you've gotten through all. All right. Oops. All right, so is doctrine an improvement, right? We have this DAO layer. It's good for fairly simple queries. When you want to look up a single record, um, you can do it by ID or by a field, but it's very difficult to do joins, uh, very difficult to do projections and groupings and statistics and so on. Um, and it's, it's old. Uh, the underlying uh, DB data object isn't maintained anymore. Uh, and Doctrine is a much more modern framework. Doctrine has a large community behind it. It's popular uh, in Symfony and a lot of the other current generation PHP frameworks. Um, and it has a rather sophisticated query builder built in, uh, which is useful for dynamically generating queries like we do in the Civi Advanced Search or in custom searches. All right, but what does Doctrine look like? The first and a very important aspect of using Doctrine is defining your data model, and you do that with PHP classes and annotations. So in this case, we are looking at the data model for emails in Civi CRM, and it's just a class. It has an annotation that says at orm entity, which means Doctrine will map it into the database. We give some instructions uh, on special rules for how to map it into the database, like using the table name, Civi CRM underscore email, defining some indices, et cetera. Uh, a key thing about this is that it's one file in our current system with DAOs, the information is actually split up between several files. You have the XML, which defines schema. Then you generate the DAO, which is kind of formulaic. And then you manually create the BAO to add in additional functions, um, to add in standard helper functions for dealing with that entity. In Doctrine's model, you have one class, and you see all those pieces together, so it's easier to get a, a quick snapshot from the code of how the data model is defined. Um, another key detail to note here is towards the bottom, there's a property called private contact. It's got a type of civi contact contact. That property is an object. When we want to program with the email uh, or with the contact record, we can use object properties to go back and forth between them. Um, this is often a lot more concise, more pithy than writing SQL queries. So that would replace as well the query class? Or? Yes. Uh, it would mostly replace the query class. It would significantly thin it out because Doctrine's query builder provides similar functionality. Um, an example of how to use it. Doctrine provides an entity manager, which is your entry point for all data access. You can tell it to run a query. We're going to search for, e search for email records based on an email address and then print out all of the contact records that have that email address. Hopefully there's only one, but sometimes there are duplicates and so on. So our query here uh, uses parameters, email adder, and it gets the result as an array. The array is something you can loop through, and as you loop through it, you can access properties, dollar sign email, arrow get contact, arrow get display name. If you were doing raw SQL, you would need to do a series of joins there. If we were doing DAOs, you would need to fetch the email DAO, read the ID, and then fetch the contact DAO and read the display name, and that would take two to three times as much code. So we started doing experiments on this, uh, I think it was early this year. Um, and what, 
uh, we've published our experiments in GitHub under a branch called the Doctrine Branch. Uh, the main goal of the experiments is to figure out how we can make a major change, how we can make this major refactoring of Civi's code base to use Doctrine instead of DAOs, um, and overall to reduce the number of steps in managing entities. So a little bit about what's going on in the Doctrine branch. Um, there's a change in how we process entities. In Civi version one through version four, there's a folder called XML schema, contains a whole bunch of XML files. You execute the gen code script, and it writes out a DAO, it writes out a SQL file. For version five, for the Doctrine branch, we get rid of the XML schema folder, and instead we have PHP files with entity annotations. We read those entity annotations and generate DAOs in SQL. Now, why do we do that? That's a transition mechanism. There's a lot of existing code that deals with DAOs, and we need to provide some compatibility for the time being. Eventually, we want to phase that out. Can we phase it out in version five? Can we phase it out in 5.1 or six? Not quite known yet, but we would like to phase it out eventually. So coming back to this problem of creating uh, a whole slew of files in order to define your data model, this is a snippet of how you create a new entity in Civi's current framework. You have your XML file, you auto-generate a DAO class, the DAO class is extended by a BAO class, which has some code that you write inside of it, and then you have a series of standalone functions which provide an API for accessing that class. Right? That's a whole lot of code. The end result of all of that is this interface, which hopefully everyone here has used at some point, where you call Civi CRM API, you specify, yes, or API 3, hopefully. Um, and you specify the entity name, action, params. In the Doctrine branch, we sorted out a way to make that a whole lot thinner. So you declare your Doctrine entity, note the annotation at ORM entity is the same annotation we saw earlier, but we add one more annotation called Civi API entity. That's all you have to do to expose the world region, in this case, as an entity through the public-facing API. Um, so the key thing here is that it's all metadata-driven and it's all generic programming, um, which I think we'll see in, a, We'll look at that a little bit more in a second. Um, we can do some variations on this. So optionally, the world region entity might have its own permission model, where you say that anyone with ad the permission administer regions can read and write those records, but nobody else can. Anybody else can get world regions, but they can't create delete. Um, that's a simplification, but I think for most entities, having a simple permission like that is a good starting point, and you can develop richer things uh, later on. But it's good to start with a default. Um, how does that work? It works by reorganizing the Civi CRM underscore API function. If you look in Civi 4.2, Four or any older version, the Civi API function is quite long. It's a few hundred lines long, and it's fairly nuanced. There are several different code paths for handling errors in different ways and so on. To provide for generic APIs based on doctrine, we totally split that up into smaller pieces. And what is left is an API kernel that looks a lot like the uh, HTTP kernel that you will find in, say, Symfony's web processing framework. The kernel uses two key concepts, providers, which define APIs. So the magic function provider is 
uh, a way to define APIs based on global functions and a certain naming pattern, right? That's what we've been doing up to, till now. All of API v3 is based off of the magic function provider. Another way to define APIs is using doctrine. Any doctrine entity that has the annotation uh, civi API entity on it becomes accessible through this doctrine CRUD provider. The reflection provider uses some internal services and tells you about the API reflectively. A lot of the corner cases that were in the API function have been pulled out into their own classes, which means we can add and remove these features at will. For example, transactions, right? As soon as you submit an API call, you might want to begin a SQL transaction, and upon failure, you roll back the SQL transaction. Upon success, you commit the SQL transaction. Um, or xdebug provides profiling information. When, a tran excuse me, when an API call begins, you make a note of the current time. When the API call ends, you make a note of the current time, and then you see the difference and report that uh, as part of the API. So just a quick snippet here. The Doctrine CRUD provider has, uh, is registered with the kernel in line 183 at the top there. And by registering with the kernel, with the kernel we get notifications at line 40 in the next file in the invoke function. Anytime someone makes a call to an API with version 4 in, in the params, the request gets routed here, and the Doctrine CRUD provider determines how it should read and write the records. We use Doctrine's APIs. We use the query builder, which is a powerful part of Doctrine, um, to convert the API request into Doctrine speak. Subscribers in line, let's see, third, excuse me, 181 at the top, we register our xdebug subscriber. Uh, in line 33, down below, we declare how this subscriber participates in the API. Specifically, it participates in the responses to the API. It doesn't get involved in pre-processing or validation of requests. All it cares about is doing something when sending a response. So when sending the response for an API request, it specifically checks to see if Xdebug is available, and it asks Xdebug what information we have about the runtime and memory usage of the system. All right, so that's a little bit about how Doctrine works and about what we've done with the Doctrine branch. That doesn't actually get us to Civi version 5 running Doctrine and everything being clean and consistent. There's a big migration question. What do I mean by migration? Well, if you look uh, throughout the Civi code base, you find a whole lot of lines that look like these. Right, the first one is working with DAOs in a fairly traditional fashion. The second example is working with DAOs in a somewhat abridged fashion, but all of that is tied to the DAO nomenclature and the DAO coding conventions, and we eventually want to replace those lines with doctrine lines. To get some sense for the scope, I did grepping on the code base to find how many spots in the code uh, have a line like that first one, where it says new CRM foo DAO. And there's about 997. There's also this new BAO, which is functionally equivalent. It's a minor variation. And there's 350 of those. The get field value, 850 of those. Similar function set field value 94. And sort of ad hoc manually written SQL queries, there's 1,100 of those. Or actually, let's make that 1,400 of those. Uh, because there are also single value queries. The point is, there's a whole lot to hunt down if we're going to replace uh, the DAO calls with doctrine calls. This is hard. Um, I've tried talking to different people at the conferences and at the sprints to get ideas for how we can tackle this problem in a realistic fashion. You know, how do we, how do we tackle it without getting 
pulled into a quagmire that delays our release schedules by six months and causes us to focus entirely on internal minutia and not producing features and so on. At San Francisco, uh, it, back in April, I wasn't very committed, wanted to provoke conversation with a presentation like this. Here, I've got a bit more of a proposal that's been shaped by that conversation and by the sprints since then, and we'll come to that in a few minutes. But just out of due diligence, a little bit of a walkthrough for how we might do this, right? Three ideas have come up. One idea is to do an automatic transformation, right? Maybe we are regex masters. We can do a little bit of kung fu with string manipulation and search through our code base and find every line that looks like new CRM foo DAO bar and change it to entity manager, create query builder for civi foo bar, et cetera, et cetera. There's a benefit to doing this, right? It provides stylistic consistency. All of the code looks like doctrine code because you've run all of the code through the transform. You don't wind up with a mix of DAO and doctrine that can be rather confusing for a new developer to get their head around, and for an existing developer. It provides you a basis for doing cleaner doctrine development in the future, and it improves the size of the code slash runtime. You don't have two data management layers active concurrently, which increases the amount of code that has to be loaded, which decreases efficiency. All right, so there's a problem. Regex doesn't really work because the patterns are really hard to write. So notice the DAO in the first snippet is consistently used in each line. In the second snippet, we have two variables instead of one variable. So we need to define additional variables as we're going through and transforming the code. Um, that's, that's complicated. It can be done. You know, if we get the abstract syntax tree of the PHP code and we're very smart about how the PHP code is organized, we can, we can find a way, but that's tough. Now, here's a question. If we do that, what have we really gained? Um, yes, there's some consistency and some performance, but when I look at that change and just go by the gut, what's the emotional reaction to the first snippet and the second snippet? We've traded about 40 words for about 40 words, about seven lines of meh, for another seven lines of meh. It's not a big improvement. What we really want is a line like the bottom there, where it takes all seven and replaces it by one line that's relatively clear uh, and simple. Now, I'm all gung-ho for automated transformations. Meta programming is cool stuff. Um, but I'm not really sure that I can do meta programming to capture all the code in Civ. I'm not, I'm not sure how many times that exact pattern shows up in the code versus other variations on the pattern. Um, maybe if we think long and hard and experiment a lot, we can do it. But you know, Linus Torvalds has this, this comment about good taste, that writing good code is a matter of taste and an automatic transform doesn't provide us with good taste. All right, fine. So maybe we'll do it manually. We'll go find all the code that looks like the first part and rewrite it with the second part. And we're intelligent, we have good taste, we can sort it out. How hard is that? Well, basically, all of our BAO code looks like the first snippet there. So the quickest way to estimate how much code we have to examine and rewrite is to look at the BAOs. There's 90,000 lines worth of code in the BAOs. That's 90,000 lines. A lot of it isn't tested in an automated fashion, so it's hard to QA. Um, a lot of it 
deals with corner cases that you might not understand immediately, and it, it, it's a very difficult prospect to change 90,000 lines en masse like that. There would be benefits. Um, you know, the BAOs would come out looking nicer. Some of our form controllers would look nicer. In the process of going through and reviewing every line in there, we'd have an opportunity for critical discussion and peer comments, but it's just so labor intensive. And it, it seems hard to justify such a labor intensive thing when all we're changing is the BAO layer. We're not changing the overall architecture. We're not making the overall system simpler. So that led to the third approach, which is to change everything. You know, if we're going to do manual transformations, it's so invasive, we should just go all in. And this sounded absolutely crazy to me when I first heard it. Right. I'm from a school of thought which says you do incremental change, you do refactorings, you always know where you stand because you have unit tests that validate where you stand, but our unit test coverage isn't all that great and our architecture needs to change in very radical ways. So there's some sense to it, there's some lessons, uh, excuse me, there's some, um, some value when we look out at the broader programming community um, that give credence to this approach. In the Symphony world, there's a Sonata admin, which is a very popular module, and it is a metadata-driven way to produce your forms, right? It looks at your entities and creates form elements that are uh, properly synchronized, so a, uh, a multi-select displays on a form automatically as a multi-select a text field displays as a single line text field, and a text blob displays as a WYSIWYG text editor. Another possible benefit of change everything is that we can get away from Smarty and QuickForm, which are sort of moribund within the PHP community, and align ourselves with another framework. Uh, in the JavaScript world, there's a lot of very active development and uh, a lot of quality frameworks are being produced there by a bigger community. Okay, so let's, let's examine this idea a bit more of change everything. What, what's involved in those exclamation marks? That seems like a pretty big ellipsis there. Um, And this is where we're really getting into new material that has not been widely discussed or vetted through the community yet. S this discussion is more at the concept stage and I'm looking for comments, questions, criticisms, suggestions, alternatives, trying to figure out how much support there is for this concept uh, of replacing the middle tier. There is a lot of interest in replacing the middle tier. Um, I think we've had some lessons learned from our form management from the middle tier over the past decade. Um, and to talk a little bit about those lessons, it's helpful to recap how we manage forms right now. In the initial versions of Civi, creating a form was a matter of defining a PHP class and a Smarty template if you wanted to customize it you would override the PHP class, or you would override the template. Um, there was some simpler customization you could do with profiles, where in a very controlled fashion, one field or two fields can be added in to a form. Uh, and that works with standalone profiles or contribution screens, event registration screens, et cetera. The nice thing about the form template override system is that it's exceedingly flexible, but it's also exceedingly brittle. Uh, when Civi core upgrades, you need to change your overridden PHP class or your overridden template to correspond. Profiles are actually pretty flexible. Uh, I, let, me, let me rephrase that. Profiles um, 
are useful for getting the first name field, the last name field, the phone numbers onto the screen, but they're not useful for doing layout on a page, and they still require a lot of work for customized screens. Our approach to developing and customizing forms evolved a bit, so instead of doing overrides for forms and templates, nowadays you can do hooks. Um, there's the hook alter content, which takes the output of uh, HTML and allows you to strip through it. There's the region system, which allows you to find a particular part of the page and inject HTML in there. Uh, there's hooks for beginning the process, for be, uh, building a form where you can add new form elements, for processing the form and validating the form, but that's still pretty brittle because you're still tied in to uh, basically every piece of the form processing whenever you write a customization. If there's a change in one form element in an upstream form, then you might need to rework the downstream customization. Web Forms of CRM has been an another approach to managing forms in Civi, and it's actually been a very successful approach, I would say. You know, it's m much more flexible than profiles, it's easier to maintain than the hooks or the overrides, and uh, it allows a mix of entities. You can process an event registration and a contribution record and uh, custom fields all in the same form. But it has sort of a weird user experience where you go over to one tab and you say here are the Civi CRM fields and then you go over to another tab and you drag fields around to position them. Um, it's sort of a split experience. It has some dependency issues. So Web, web Form 3 to Web Form 4 was a bit of a transition. Uh, its future isn't quite certain. Uh, Entity Forms has kind of been replacing it in, in the Drupal community and it's not likely to be supported in Drupal 8. It's Drupal only. It doesn't work with our WordPress installations or our Joomla installations. So the overall picture here is that we've had four systems. Each of them has provided us with some value, but it's inconsistent. And we need to take the lessons from these and do a round of consolidation in our form layer to get the benefits of all of them in, in one system. My laptop is showing the spinny wheel. I'm trying to go to the next slide. There we go. Oh, oh. Lever offices quit. Um, so the, the principal difficulty with that is mapping Symfony concepts into all three of the CMSs, uh, things like session management and user management. Uh, Okay, so if we're going to replace the form system, that's a very big project and needs to be broken down a bit. I've got four abstractions that I think are useful to, to separate. There's a form definition, like in <coughs> Drupal you have the form API, which is a, a big array of all the elements in the form, and certain conventions like using a hash mark to indicate attributes and using not a hash mark to embed fields and widgets. Um, you have a widget library, which is the collection of things that can go into a form and get displayed. You have a form designer. Um, like in older versions of Civi, you create profiles and add fields onto the profiles. You, in web form, we talked about that experience where you click on the Civi CRM tab and 
select a certain range of fields to include. All of that is form design. And then you have a form runtime for presenting this to end users. I point out this architecture with four components because it's possible to replace some of those components. I don't think the Civi Core project should be responsible for it, but I've talked to s multiple developers who are interested in providing their own variations of the form runtime. Um, I can talk a little bit more about why one would do that later. All right, so form definition. A form is defined as a list of entities, fields, and bindings between them. In web form, uh, you start out, excuse me, in web form Civi CRM, you start out by choosing one contact or two contact records and a relationship between them, or two contact records and a contribution and an event registration record. Those are four different entities being used. And for each of them, you can choose a set of fields or widgets that are associated to include, to display on the form. And there's a connection between the field and the entity, it, the data model. I would argue for form definitions today being written in JSON. In Civi's profile system, it, form definitions are stored in SQL tables. You have a table called UF group and a table called UF field and you do joins on them and all of that, it's actually a little bit of overkill and it's quicker to get a JSON document. Um, and a JSON document, for those of you who are Drupal fans, is very similar to Drupal's form API structure. It's basically a big array, a tree of widgets to include on the form. The language of the JSON document in this proposal is essentially a list of Angular directives. Angular has its own component model for <coughs> defining widgets. How does a, a widget get onto the screen? How do you initialize it? How do you validate it? Tear it down at the end uh, of the page view, and so on. And I, I believe in reusing uh, someone else's component model, specifically Angular's. The widget library, some key attributes, it's medium grained. Uh, a fine grained uh, collection of widgets might be a checkbox field and a text field and a text area field, right? You have one datum uh, for each field element. A coarse grained set of forms might be something like Civi CRM's contribution form where it includes all the payment stuff and all the, um, uh, the membership levels and the contribution levels and the first name, last name, it's, it's a whole lot of fields all put together. Medium grain, we're trying to take a few fields that are closely related and treat them as one widget. For example, the street address is a collection of fields, you know, street number, street name, city, state, postal code, country, county, longitude, latitude for some odd places. And there's a natural layout or conventional layout that most people use to relate those fields. Um, that collection of fields is subject to localization. If you're in the US or the UK, you might arrange them differently. But it's still something that can be predefined and, and pre-styled. The widget library consists of a number of manifests, you know, a listing of the widgets and um, metadata about them, i.e., what's the Angular directive that we use to render the widget, what's the Angular directive for um, configuring it. Using Angular directives is nice because we can take advantage of their testing framework and all their documentation for developers, um, and we can set up some PHP side code to deal with it too. The form designer uh, might look a bit like that. That's an old mock-up. I, I think new mock-ups might be nice, but the, the key points about this mock-up is that we have a split between a canvas, 
over on the left hand side and a pallet on the right hand side and you drag widgets over from the right hand side onto the left. Um, you can add entities such as an individual um, down here and then they show up on the palette with a list of the fields and widgets that are applicable. Anything else? The form designer, uh, how would we implement it, test it? It's basically something which takes JSON documents as input and provides JSON documents as output. Testing it is a matter of um, simulating a series of clicks uh, that an administrator might do in this interface and ensuring that the right JSON document is spit out. Last piece, the form runtime. Uh, form runtime builds on the widget library, it builds on the form definition, uh, you know, it reads in that JSON document, then loads up the appropriate widgets and puts them on a screen. The core implementation of the, the form runtime is based on Angular and Bootstrap. Uh, it could be something that's based on Drupal's form API, or it could be based on Joomla's form API, i.e. you take any of Civi CRM's forms and you render them through Drupal's system, which means that Drupal themers can customize um, in their own way. I don't think that should be part of Civi Core. I think Civi Core needs one standard way um, that works across platforms and works out of the box. But for uh, high end implementations and uh, site uh, designers, having an option to use Drupal or Joomla or WordPress's theming system uh, would be quite useful. A lesson from working with Angular in the past few months for Civi 4.5. Angular requires that you load all of the JavaScript elements that go onto a page at the very beginning of the page. Um, this is fine if you have a small number of elements, but if you're going to support an application as big as Civi, then that basically means loading a large library of widgets and forms up front, which would not be particularly performant, right? You, you'd have to have this user experience, which I imagine you've all seen in, in some web applications where, like Gmail, where you go to the page and there's a progress bar as it's loading components and it's kind of slow, but as soon as it's loaded all the components, it's fast to switch between pages and do various things. That's great for the back end, and I, I think there's a place for Civi to uh, have a, a multi-page back end processor that can display these forms um, with quick transitions, but a slow load time, a slow initial load time. However, for contribution pages and event registration pages, it's very important that we get the, everything on the screen quickly and, and we not drive away users. So the single page front end takes in the same form definitions, it takes in the same widget library, but it compiles all the elements in, into an optimized package so that we can quickly set up the screen for public facing forms. Does anybody recognize this? No, all right, so I don't really play video games. Oh, what is it? Civilization. That's right, it's Civilization. It's a computer game um, which originates in the 1990s when I was a kid and I played that game a lot. Nowadays I play it maybe once a month, maybe. Uh, <laughs> Depends on the month. There's some months where, uh, yeah. Regardless, um, I, I've been trying to think about how to organize a big project like this forum project. And, you know, the, the first inclination that comes out is to do phases. And every conversation I've had about phases 
somebody talks about phase one, phase two, phase three, and it makes me feel a little weird inside, a little queasy and uncomfortable, like I don't quite get phase one, phase two, phase three. Yes, you, we can count. So phase one comes before phase two, and there's a total of three phases, but it doesn't give us any sense for the meaning of a phase, the theme of it, how the phases relate to each other, right? Why are we doing phase one before phase two? Why not totally switch around the order and swap parts between them, right? It, it's kind of arbitrary. So I prefer to give names to phases. And I've got names for the phases that I use in my strategy with civilization. You cannot play civilization against me ever because I'm going to reveal my strategy and it reveals my weaknesses. Um, but it comes in three phases. There's exploration, settlement, and expansion or conquest, right? In the exploration phase, you start out and you really don't know anything about your problem domain. You don't know how big the problem is. And we're kind of at that phase, I think, with forms. We have, we have some sense from our experience, but when we get in and do work, we're gonna learn a lot more. Uh, we're going to learn there are things we didn't know. And the best way to, to get breadth, uh, to find out what, what it is that we don't know uh, is to explore quickly. So in civilization, you might send out a, a little unit like that guy to faraway lands as quick as possible, right? You try to create you know, three or four units uh, just to explore. And it's great. You get intelligence on how the land is laid out. You know where the problem spots are. You know who your competitors are going to be. But you're very vulnerable because you're military units are far flung. If somebody attacks you in the beginning, if there's some uh, major snafu in the beginning, it can throw the whole thing off. Um, so the key thing is to make the exploration phase quick and broad so that you have a, a small window in which problems can get thrown at you. Or you can have, yeah. In the settlement phase, you try to consolidate, you try to build up defenses, build up a machine that can be productive uh, and stable. In coding, such a machine is a system with unit tests, with documentation, with clear specs. Uh, and it's really a bad idea to do a large amount of development without having unit tests and clear specs on your core system. So after we've explored a bit um, and gotten some breadth, we come back, we, we figure out what the fundamentals were, what we've discovered in our exploration, and implement something very stable at the core. Once we have that solid core, it's easier to roll out and start doing additional widgets, additional use cases, uh, expanding from uh, contribution handling to event registration and also replacing backend forms, like just broadening the scope. How to get involved in CiviCRM version five, you know, come to the sprints, um, come to the conference like this, raise questions and criticisms and all of that. On the forum, there's a place called the 5.0 Saloon where we've been throwing out lots of ideas for what should be in 5.0, discussing some of the merits and the costs associated with them. Learn a JS framework because that's how much of the web is being developed right now. It's where a lot of the energy is and I, I think no matter what solution we wind up with, a contemporary JS framework like Angular will be a centerpiece of it and play with doctrine. If you go to buildkit.civicrm.org, it has instructions on how to set up a uh, development environment for Civi, and once you have buildkit installed, you can use this command, Civi build, create doctrine. It will automatically download Drupal and Civi CRM and get the right branch and composer and, doc and doctrine and then all the other dependencies and set them up. And that's it.
Yes. <laughs> yes. So uh, just because I've got the mic here, for, the question was um, about Google's long-term support for Angular, that Google has some track record of setting up cool services like Google Wave and then shutting it down, and it's just gone from the internet, right? And are we uh, putting ourselves at risk uh, by adopting Angular as the JavaScript framework? Um, th there is certainly a risk that Google will withdraw support. I think, however, that Angular's community is quite big right now on its own. Um, and I think that even if you look at other projects where the model has been community-oriented, they've still had that problem. So HTML quick form and DB data object, which are the current libraries in Civi, came out of the Pair project. Pair was very open. It had this ethos of you know, community development. And it still totally died. And uh, I mean, I, there's no guarantee with any upstream provider. Uh, I feel like the best heuristics you can use are to look at the overall size of the community, the overall volume of interest around it. And on that front, I feel Angular is succeeding a bit more than any single other JavaScript framework. There are other ones that are successful today, but I don't think they've hit quite the same volume. Yep. And, and for the mic, the other comment there was that um, we have experimented with a few different JavaScript frameworks, particularly Backbone, and we found that the learning curve was extremely difficult for new developers with Backbone. For a, an open source community driven project like this, the learning curve is a very important criterion. And our experience was that Angular had a much gentler learning curve or much more even learning curve than Backbone. Yes. Yeah. So will that still work or will we need to migrate to the upstream as well? Good question. So the question was um, about uh, an installation that has a number of customizations and extensions. And when uh, you look through the code in that particular installation, you found that there's a whole bunch of DAO code. Um, and what's the support path, basically, for someone in that position? Um, I would say a couple things. For 5.0, we're definitely not looking to remove the DAOs, right? right? That's, uh, that's too much. Um, so we're looking at a model where doctrine and DAOs coexist for a number of releases. I think that uh, if we have this improved form system, you'll find it's easier to write and maintain a lot of the customizations on top of the, the new form system, which uses doctrine internally, um, rather than maintaining the DAO code. So over the course of several release cycles, whenever you patch or update the extension, you'd probably switch it over. Thank you. 
So the question was about performance and uh, th there's one uh, school of practice in which you load all you, in which you load things on the page in a lazy fashion, uh, sort of as it's needed. And that seems very different from Angular's approach where you load most things up front. Um, so my view, I guess, is that for the back end, the range of things you need to load is relatively broad, but the users can be tolerant of an initial load time as long as it's only one initial load time, right? And as long as they're back end users. If, it's, if you're talking about front end users, the tolerance levels are totally different. Um, I would love to have incremental loading in this framework. And in fact, the Angular community has been talking about this a fair amount. It's something that they're targeting for Angular 2.0. In Angular 1.x, it's not got a standardized solution. So my main fear is I don't think we should develop something really customized on top of Angular to provide the incremental loading. Um, I think in the near term, it would make sense to sort of bifurcate between the back end interface and the front end interfaces with different optimizations for each. In the long term, hopefully Angular 2.0 comes out and provides the functionality we need so that we can do incremental loading and uh, give good performance all around. Okay, good question. Uh, so the question was, um, with the reliance on JavaScript, how does it affect the accessibility of front-end forms? My understanding, and I am by no means an accessibility expert, I would love to learn more about how to provide an accessible system. Um, but my general understanding is that the key issues in accessibility are your tag structure, right? Using like nested tables, for example, for a layout is extremely difficult for someone on a screen reader. And it, it's better to use semantic tags um, with a relatively flat structure. I think that using JavaScript to compose those tags, to compose the HTML document or the DOM, doesn't really change the design of the tags. You can do that on P, the PHP side well or badly. You can do that on the JavaScript side well or badly. But I don't think the use of JavaScript as the renderer changes the issue. Except that you need JavaScript. Except that you need JavaScript, <laughs> yes. Uh, I was wondering, all these changes doctrine and these format templates and Angular, is, there, uh, is it widely agreed upon, uh, upon that these should be the things, uh, what the direction it should take, and these should be the things that are in version 5? And uh, is there any sort of well, preliminary time frame to when all this yeah, would, would Okay. So there were two questions. The first question was, is there a consensus on these things going into version five? And the second question is, what's the time frame? And the answer on both of those is basically no. Um, <laughs> I, there is not a strong consensus on what to do for version five, but I do feel there's a strong consensus that the issues I, uh, this design addresses are the key issues facing civic customization that it's incredibly difficult to create forms in a, a way that's easy for end users, in a way that's easy to maintain, and that mixes things in a sane fashion. Um, I think it would be, uh, I've put this out because it's best in my experience when dealing with a complex design to have a starting point that other people can pick apart. Um, it may be that the proper design for version five is totally different than this. By all means, propose something else, pick it apart. But I, I think that this is the right sort of problem and, and scope. Um, in terms of timeline, no, there's no timeline. If there's no consensus, there's no timeline. Well, uh, I agree for one that this is the right direction to get it up to modern standards. Cool. I think there is a consensus. 
this about good form and duty of Jack, this is it should leave. <laughs> so those were several affirmative comments that, yes, these are the problems. Right. Years, doing, we are going to do just the contribution page or just the admin page that does uh, the profile or whatever. So the question was about how to slice and dice the, the project plan. Do we do it horizontally or vertically? Horizontally in terms of identifying each layer and replacing it one layer at a time versus vertically identifying a feature area or a use case and replacing that use case. And I think the answer is that in the overall project plan, um, we need to address the full stack um, up front, but we need to target it at specific use cases. So for example, we might say in 5.0 that the use case of an administrator <coughs> looking at a contact record, the edit contact screen, the view contact screen, that particular use case should be switched over to the new form system, but all the other use cases should, should still continue running on BAOs and QuickForm and Smarty. Then in the next release, 5.1, we replace the event registration screen with something based on this form layer. Does that seem like a reasonable answer? I think so, but yeah, the first phase is then useful and important to do early to know where we should aim at. Yes. But all the exploratory see it, we can have a stack and full stack that works. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. So I feel like none of us in this room are stock connects or super angular. Is there any any outreach that we could do um, to bring those team members to us to discuss the stock and the best practices of that rather than us trying to figure this out ourselves? I feel like you might have an answer to that question already. Like it's a, implicitly a suggestion. I so feel like, I feel like we are trying to muddle through this on our own, which I think there's some benefit, but it's a bit lonely. And I find that I think the Drupal community, the way they've engaged with this in the community, is very productive. Okay, uh, and so for the the. the microphone, so some of the comments here, were, the question was about how do we relate to the other open source projects like Angular and Doctrine? Um, do we bring them in to consult with us as part of this process? And that the Drupal community with D8 did that with Symfony, where the Drupal core team or Acquia or someone there uh, hired the Symfony, uh, what's their organization? Sensio um, to come in and consult. And yeah, I think that's a good idea. Uh, I don't know that they would be interested in consulting with us for free. I think that some of our design goals are a bit different from a typical doctrine installation or a typical Angular project. In particular, it's very important for us that end users be able to customize the forms in a graphical manner. And I think the standard user experience, uh, excuse me, the standard developer experiences that are built around Angular and Doctrine are targeted more at developers and designers who are comfortable with editing some HTML and editing some PHP. Um, that said, I, they might have a lot of insight and I think it would be great if we could talk to them. Hmm. Messing around and having the staging that different than the production and all the all that jazz. I would say that my view on that being a consensus comes from the observation of web forms to be CRM and its popularity 
in our community. I think that often you know, people come into the forums and they say, I have this problem, and the response is, you should switch over to Drupal and use Web Forms of ECRM because it's the way to do it. Um, I think if we don't treat uh, forms as something that are manageable <coughs> through the web interface by a, a semi-skilled technical user, then we're probably burning a large part of our user base. All right, anything else? I guess that's it, thanks guys. Yeah.